We are emotional. Like, I'm, I'm very emotional. I accept that. I'm, I'm, I'm probably too emotional. I'm all emotion. I'm no logic. Now, these days, I don't know about you, I don't even wait to the end of a sentence before I decide whether I'm getting good news or bad news. I just, I emote so quickly. I have to. I actually don't think I'm the only one. I, I've got a joke I think sums this up. In order to tell you this joke, I'm going to have to reveal some information that's secret, so let's keep it in the room. <laughs> but it has recently emerged that me and my wife are expecting a child. <laughs> that, you, have to, you have to let me finish. You have to let me finish. We're expecting a child to make some pretty serious accusations yeah. against me. <laughs> <laughs> um, How do you think that went for you? you <laughs> yes, you're my type of audience. You're emotional people. There's no way this will blow up in our face. I like that joke. I like it, because it's sort of offensive, but it isn't, you know? Because I don't really do offensive comedy. I'm not really interested in shock comedy, you know? There's debates at the minute about shock comedy. Is it right, is it wrong? The main thing is, I just think it's boring. I think it's easy. Anyone can do it, anyone. Anyone can just use an offensive word, you know, a trigger word, trick an audience's emotion into feeling something. You know, bombolio, paedophilia, necrophilia, rape, murder. Anyone. Because also, use your head. Murder, far worse act. Murder's the worst thing a person can do. But that word, murder, doesn't shock us. Like those other words. It's far more socially acceptable. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> right, if you don't believe me, let me just ask you all a question, right? Do you think that Sophie Ellis Baxter <laughs> would have had anywhere near the level of success that she had if she'd released a single called Paedophilia on the Dance Floor. Like, you're never gonna burn that goddamn house right down, don't you know what they're doing in there? I certainly don't think Agatha Christie was ever going to write a Poirot novel called Necrophilia on the Orient Express. <laughs> What's the twist? You all fucked him. Is that the twist? <laughs> That's an example of a joke I wouldn't tell. Because so. <laughs> I don't want to be part of this intensification of the language. The way we talk to each other now, way too fucking, way too intense. Way too intense. Like, especially online. Like, I'm not on social media, don't matter any of you lot, but I'm off all social media for good. And when I say that, you know, I do have all my accounts. I post every day. But I'm... <laughs> but I can't live with how intense the language is on there. Particularly on Instagram, I have to say. I think it's the worst one in many ways. Now, I've got a, a, an observation about Instagram. Now look, cards on the table. I worry this observation is at best lazy and at worst genuinely sexist. But do hear me out, because I, I said it to my wife and she said, no, it's actually a pretty good observation. You should use it if you get a nice crowd. And you're a lovely crowd. Do you mind if I try it? Yeah. All right, cool, right. Women, right. <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> I just think the way that women interact with each other on Instagram, is way too intense and needs to be dulled back immediately and permanently, you know? Like, if I post a photo on Instagram, I'll get a couple of comments. You know, my friends might write something stupid, what time's the dog parade? It does really hurt. <laughs> my wife posts a photo on Instagram, her friends react like we are living in an epic Greek tragedy, okay? <laughs> she just posts a normal photo of her just in a park, just someday. Her friends will say things like, once again, your beauty has rendered me speechless. <laughs> I will place a dagger in my heart if you do not tell me where you got thine dungarees. <laughs> Surely only Zeus himself has enough fire emojis to do justice to your hair. <laughs> Bit of fun. <laughs> so that's why I'm off it. Trying to be the social medias. It's hard, isn't it? Because it's addictive. That's the point. They build it to be addictive. And it's media. You forget about that bit. It's still media. So it's like a news source. Twitter is a news source. And it's addictive. I mean, the old media 
The mainstream media, some people call it the lame street media. It's pretty funny, you give him that. <laughs> like it has its issues. It was never habit forming, you know? Like I've never had a homeless person run up to me in the street and go, hey man, you got a fucking copy of the Times? <laughs> like it's, you shouldn't be addicted to the news. The point I'm trying to say. And the newspapers in general, the physical newspapers, I don't know. Like, I think we're gonna miss them. I think we're gonna miss it. Because in 10 years, I think it's fair to say newspapers, physical newspapers will be gone. And I think of all the things in our era of life, newspapers are the one thing that are gonna really blow future generations away. They're not gonna be able to handle it. Like imagine telling a kid in 30 years what a newspaper was. They'd be like, you're telling me there was a 7,000 page document <laughs> with all the news in it and all the sport and some of them just had tits in. <laughs> I go, yeah, that's what we had before the internet. We had this sort of big Argos catalogue full of news and sport, and yes, topless women, but also money advice, war photos, Garfield comics. It was a very complicated time. What was it like once a month you'd get it? Every single day of your life. There was a new one waiting for you at your doorstep every day of your life. What, there wasn't like a shop that you went to? <laughs> this is gonna sound crazy. We hired children to bring them to us. <laughs> I don't know how any of it was legal, to be honest. We had massive heavy bricks full of tits and images of war, and we summoned the children from their beds. <laughs> Future generations are gonna view paper boys the way that we view chimney sweeps. Let that one knock around in there for a bit. But even then, you know, I say that, you know, newspapers, everyone thinks newspapers were perfect, maybe. Newspapers weren't perfect. Of course they weren't. They still lied. They still had agendas. They were owned by people who tried to tell us things. That's why I always loved the BBC. I always loved the BBC. The good old British broadcasting. Because the BBC, right? The BBC was impartial. That was the point. It showed both sides of the story. These days, I don't know about you, I think the BBC is a bit too impartial. I think they're spooked. I think they're showing two sides of stories, but there are no two sides. I mean, there's still a right and a wrong in this world. You agree with that? There's still a right and a wrong. Yeah, of course. Like, I met a woman in Portsmouth recently. She ate sandwiches with a spoon. That's wrong. <laughs> but I couldn't say that on the BBC. I couldn't go on the BBC and be like, look, you shouldn't eat sandwiches with a spoon, all right? <laughs> Not unless there was also someone there from the South Hampshire Sandwich Spoon Alliance <laughs> telling me to get out your London bubble. Find out how people in Britain are really eating their sandwiches. <laughs> Everything on the BBC has to have two sides, everything. And I'm now gonna tell you a joke that has literally never worked once, okay? <laughs> okay? Everything on the BBC has to have two sides, everything. They can't even show planet Earth anymore. Celebration of the natural world. Not unless they also show Jeremy Clarkson's greatest oil spills, you know? <laughs> they can't even show Dad's Army. That wonderful sitcom about pensioners fighting in the Second World War. It's too one-sided. The only way they can show Dad's Army on the BBC now is if they made a second sitcom about Nazi babies. <laughs> that is the best joke of the show. <laughs> no one ever laughs at it. Do you not, do you get, you get it, right? Yeah. I think it's, all right, I've been doing this joke for a little while. I've actually been working up this idea. It's actually called Don't Tell Himmler. I think it'd be a big hit, all right? It's kind of like Rugrats, except they're cartoons. <laughs> you got guns, you, oh, you spilled juice on the killing list. <laughs> Don't tell him, love. Bow, bow, bow. <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> what time is it? Look at that. You alright? What time is it? Bloody good question, Mom. <laughs> what time is it? Time to wrap this up. <laughs> Tired, man. <laughs> it's been a good show. This you kept. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Is there no one sitting there, right? Can I sit there? Is that weird? Is that... Yeah, sit down. Do? Oh yeah, cheers. Feed the mic. Thanks, man. Oh. How you doing? 
This is all right. This is weird. It's just nice to be part, part of a group, isn't it? Oh, it's nice, isn't it? It's nice today. It's nice, yeah. I, I'm sat here now. I get why you've all been acting the way you have. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Ah! with all this. <laughs> Life's worth living. That's what I'm trying to say with all this. Life's worth living, all right? It's not to say life didn't get you down. So I said, of course, like, it's probably not ideal if you chat when I'm literally next year. How about that? <laughs> it's probably not ideal if I'm literally here. <laughs> what are you talking about? You need a wee. <laughs> Get that camera out of my face. <laughs> go, go. No, don't apologise. Go, go, go. <laughs> Anyone else need a wig? <laughs> Genuinely, you need a... All right. Everybody needs a wig. Out now. <laughs> You can go if you need it. How desperate are you? Are you sure? All right, great. Thank you. Does she actually need a wee or is she, is she, is she not coming back? She does need a wee. Yeah, good. How are you? Are you enjoying the show? Yes. I noticed you've kept your coat on the whole time. It hasn't filled me with much confidence. <laughs> you, you never felt like... You always sort of were in two minds about staying. I appreciate that. <laughs> Life's worth living. <sighs> Fucking hell. <laughs> it is worth, look, that's the, that's the point. It's not to say life didn't get you down. Of course, like, you think I haven't had setbacks? You think I haven't had dis... I mean, look at me. I'm literally sat in the front row of my own gig. <laughs> <laughs> Back in. Don't, don't apologise. You've been really respectful the whole night. I appreciate it. That's better, is it? I really, I don't need a blow-by-blow -blow analysis of it. I have gone for wheeze before. It, it is better afterwards. Do you think, I mean, life's worth living. That's the point I'm trying to make. You get that? You get setbacks in life, but that's what... Look, I've had every setback you can imagine, all right? Laughed at the BBC for pitching Don't Tell Himmler. Laughed. <laughs> Losing the UK Youth Parliament election. I lost it. Do you know I lost it to? Sarah Sneddon. What? <laughs> Germain policy was more water fountains. <laughs> she didn't mention the Iraq War once. I mean, that's a coward. That is a coward. When I found out she won, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? Sarah Sneddon? <laughs> Didn't even know she went to school locally. <laughs> Must be a pretty long commute, given she lives in Dick Cheney's pocket. <laughs> you couldn't throw me a bone? You couldn't, you couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's fun. 15 years I've been doing this. Sam, is it? Was that your name, Sam? Yeah, 15 years, Sam. 15 years. I was 19 when I started this, and I never sold out. <laughs> Proud of that, Sam. Never sold out. Never sold out. And I could have done it. I was offered everything. They offered me the world. They offered me Netflix. I spat in their face. Going, I'm not doing Netflix. Are you kidding me? I don't let big tech in. <laughs> Hen and Chicken, that's my Netflix. <laughs> offered me Amazon Prime. Do you want to do something on Prime Video? No, I don't. Do you know why? Because I'm a fucking artist, okay? <laughs> call me old fashioned, call me stubborn, but I'd rather people didn't discover my work as a byproduct of ordering a broom, okay? <laughs> it's called dignity and I shit it. <laughs> 19 when I started. How old are you, Sam? Do you want me asking? 27. 27. Oh, my God. I was doing this when I was 19. I had nothing, Sam. I had nothing. I had no friends, I had no qualifications, I had no connections. 
I just pounded the pavement every day because I just wanted to connect with people. I was angry, I was horny. <laughs> I was an incel sap, I admit that. <laughs> but I had a heart of gold. <laughs> and I just wanted to do this. That's all I wanted to, I just wanted to connect with you people. I think that's what this show is actually about, the connection. That's what life's about. It's hard sometimes. I've never been that good at connecting with people. That's all I wanted to do was this. But I couldn't, for years I had to work for the man in a call centre. I hated that job, I hated working for the man because I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to work in a call centre. I didn't want to say the same scripted words over and over again to bemuse strangers. You know, I want to... Thank you for laughing when they don't, it's so weird. I just thought maybe one day, you know, I thought maybe I could save someone one day. It's a bit hoity-toity, I appreciate that. Pretty big, it saved someone. But you know, art has saved me in the past. Comedy has saved me at my lowest points. I thought maybe I could save someone. Spoiler alert, 15 years in the game, I've never saved anyone. In fact, there's a bloke in Hereford I genuinely think I pushed over the edge. <laughs> She's asleep. She what? She'd be grateful. Oh, I should be grateful. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> what do you do, Sam? Do you want me to ask him? Um, I'm a mental health nurse. Mental health nurse? Well, you must be having a field day. I'm going to wrap this up. <laughs> What's this all about? What's this show all about? You and how good you are. <laughs> okay, let's, 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 I mean, normally I don't accept static evasions from people who've been asleep for half the game, but I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it. What do we know? I don't know. What do I know? What do I know? Shh! I love it. The audience is now policing itself. Do you think this happens for Michael McIntyre? Do you think when Michael McIntyre is recording his shows, he's got audience going, Will you shut the fuck up? Yeah. What was that, Michael? Flandraw? Was that fuck? Can you repeat that, Mike? We missed it. She's fucking bellowing next to me. Here's the point. <laughs> what do I know? What do we know? What do we know? What do I know? As a, I know I love my wife. That's all I know. I love my wife. Do you know how I know that? No one ever told me to love her. No one ever told me to love her. It's the only thing that's mine, you know? There was no billboard campaign. There was no hashtag. There was no algorithm pushing me that way. Rupert Murdoch didn't sit in an ivory tower, figure out a way I am, let's make him fall in love with her. <laughs> There's no national backstory pushed us a certain direction, we met, we fell in love, we got on, we fall apart. It's the same for all of us. All we've got is each other, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you please get that? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever given standing ovations, <laughs> but they don't tend to be followed immediately by falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> 